I think it looks as if the numbers entering have stabilized. And may I therefore wish you a good morning from uh, <coughs> the United Kingdom and a good afternoon to everyone uh, in Qatar. I am very grateful uh, to McNair Chambers, uh, the Qatar International Center for Conciliation and Arbitration and the court, uh, Qatar International Court and Dispute Resolution Center for putting on uh, this uh, short webinar. I do not uh, think you are attending this merely for the duration of the current pandemic. I think it is highly likely that as a result of the prolonged shutdown of the courts from their ordinary way of doing business and of arbitrations from meeting in person, uh, that the change will now be permanent. Uh, this is because it has proved over the last uh, 10 or 11 months that it is perfectly possible to conduct most forms of dispute resolution, whether they be arbitration uh, or uh, court proceedings over the web. And therefore, in the uh, discussion today, this is not merely for now, but I think for the future, and each will no doubt reflect on that, the kind of platforms you use, what you do about the electronic bundles, and how you change your advocacy to make certain that you do not lose the tribunal. Uh, you can normally tell if you're losing them when you're in person. It's slightly more difficult and more tricky to do it uh, in a webinar. But uh, there are ways of doing that, and I'm sure a great deal of insight will be shown into this today. So it's my pleasure to introduce the speakers. Uh, and first, uh, can I introduce Christopher Grout, who many of you will know as the registrar of the court, uh, <coughs> who has been the registrar since 2012. Uh, he holds a, a Bachelor of Laws degree and also a degree in Canon Law. Uh, he's been a barrister since 2007, but he also now sits as a deputy district judge, hearing many different types of civil and family dispute uh, in England and Wales. He has been responsible for bringing into the court probably what is one of the world's most up-to-date systems of filing, of uh, video linking, uh, and uh, of making certain that actually the courts run as if the pandemic wasn't here. Christopher. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, what I'm going to do in, in the short time I have today is try and draw on the experiences, uh, both from my role as registrar here in, in Doha, but also uh, in my uh, capacity sitting as a part-time judge in England. And because as it so happens, I've just finished a two month um, stint in London where all hearings have been conducted uh, remotely um, in light of the current uh, pandemic. And so I thought in keeping with the title and theme of today's webinar, a, a good idea would be to perhaps reflect upon um, what's worked well and what hasn't worked well um, in, the context, in the context of the hearings that have been undertaken in the last 12 months, both in Doha and in London. I'm going to try and try and do it in, in, in a chronological way um, of issues and um, that it's worth uh, thinking about both prior to, during, and then after uh, the hearing. Um, one of the first points I would like to make is that because remote hearings have become so prevalent now, there is a belief that everyone is familiar um, with them and that everyone has access to them. And one of the key points it's worth sometimes reflecting on is that it's not right to assume that all participants um, will either be familiar with or have access to the relevant technology uh, in order to participate effectively in a remote hearing. Um, two uh, case examples recently from London, but uh, one, a case involving a landlord and tenant dispute where you had multiple claimants who were all students at university um, the defendant was uh, an 80 year old uh, landlady who was owning the property. Now, when that case was listed for hearing, whether it be by a judge or whether it be by court staff, it was immediately deemed suitable for a remote hearing. The thought process, no doubt, having been that, well, all the students will have access to technology, uh, but nobody thought about whether or not the 80 year old defendant um, would be in a position to 
participate in a remote hearing. Um, and as it turned out, uh, she wasn't. And that only became apparent on the day of the hearing when I had to telephone her to find out why she wasn't present. And it was at that point she explained that she'd only been notified the day before that the hearing was going to be remote. She lived alone. She didn't have access to the internet. And so there was no way she was going to be able to effectively participate. And I had no choice in those circumstances but to adjourn the hearing um, and set it up for a hybrid uh, type hearing in the future uh, where she was able to attend court physically having, having received her COVID-19 vaccination uh, and the students participate uh, remotely uh, from home or university. And the, the, the key point that that very simple uh, example demonstrates is that there are people who are not in a position to adequately participate in remote hearings. And those who are responsible for listing cases, whether they be judges or whether they be court staff, need to make sure that they've given very careful thought um, to whether or not the people involved um, are able to adequately participate. And if they're not, put measures in place to ensure that they can participate effectively. The next point that I would like to make is that it's very important that people familiarize themselves with any relevant rules or regulations that govern the conduct of online hearings before any particular court. In the Qatar International Court, we have prepared and published a list of ground rules for remote hearings. And the court staff always make sure that those who are participating in hearings before the Qatar International Court are provided with a copy of the, of the ground rules in advance so that they can read them and raise any questions or queries they have prior to the hearing. Now, lots of other court systems do have similar uh, ground rules, but they don't always draw the party's attention to them prior to the hearing. So if a court doesn't do that, uh, it's worth remembering that the obligation really is on the parties to make sure they've checked uh, whether or not there are any applicable ground rules to the hearing that they are participating in and make sure that they familiarize themselves with them. In terms of uh, the start of the hearing, Personally, I think it's very helpful to set out any ground rules or housekeeping matters at the beginning of an online hearing so that people are well aware of how the hearing is going to be conducted. Some people use templates that they do not deviate from. I find that it's often helpful to adapt what you say depending upon the type and nature of the parties who are appearing before you. Many lawyers have now become very familiar with how these hearings are conducted and they don't need um, reminding of particular rules and regulations. But the same can't be said of unrepresented litigants. It might be the very first time they've ever appeared in court and they will not be familiar with how uh, the online hearing is to take place. And so putting in some rules and reminders at the beginning of the hearing as to how the hearing is going to be conducted is perhaps uh, very helpful. A, a practical tip that I learned uh, a difficult way is that it's also a good idea, it sounds basic, but to get people who are participating to introduce themselves at the beginning of the hearing. Uh, two reasons for that. One, you know who is appearing and in what capacity they're appearing. But two, it also gives you an opportunity to make sure that everyone's audio and video uh, facilities are working uh, correctly. Um, there have been a couple of unfortunate incidents where midway through a trial, a party who comes to speak for the first time then suddenly realizes their audio isn't working. And luckily, you can, you can often resolve that issue. But if you can't, um, you're then in difficulties, particularly if you're midway through a hearing. And so checking those things, either prior to or at the beginning of a hearing, I find is very helpful. Something, I make this observation not based on personal experience, but based on the experience of some of my colleagues, Try not to lose your patience with people who are appearing before you remotely. Um, sometimes it can be very frustrating, particularly uh, for judges, if the technology stops working and the evidence is becoming distorted, people's cameras are failing, uh, the audio is, is, is becoming intermittent. But I think it's important to remember that whoever you are and whatever role you're participating in, it's not the parties or the witnesses or the lawyer's fault if the video or the technology fails. And it's no good getting frustrated with them during the hearing uh, if that happens. Uh, you simply need to try and be patient and be courteous whilst the problem is resolved. 
On a, on a related point, uh, do be mindful that generally speaking, people can hear and uh, see uh, what you're saying and doing. It's uh, very easy when you're not physically in court, especially if you're in the comfort of your own home, to sometimes forget that you are in court and that people are observing what you're doing. And, and that rule applies equally to judges as it does anybody else. Um, there is a, a, an unfortunate uh, judgment of the Court of Appeal in England and Wales uh, from last year, uh, which involves a High Court judge who was uh, hearing care proceedings in the family court. And having heard the mother give evidence, she retired to her private chambers. The, the court uh, clerk brought through her laptop, which was closed, and put it on her desk. And unbeknownst to the judge, the link to the parties um, was still live. And unfortunately, the judge made some rather critical comments about the mother who she just heard give evidence, which was heard by all of the parties, including the mother and the lawyers. Um, the judge was invited to recuse herself on the basis that she uh, presented as, as biased. She re refused. Uh, and so the matter ultimately ended up before the Court of Appeal. And although the Court of Appeal was very sympathetic um, to the position the judge found herself in, it did overturn. Uh, the case and the matter had to be uh, reheard before a, a new judge. And so that case really does highlight the problems that can arise where you think you're having a private conversation when in fact it's being broadcast to everyone. So my advice is to always assume that people can hear and see you um, unless it's very obvious that that's not the case. Um, just a couple of other points I, I would like to make. Uh, one is that if you're appearing as a lawyer, it's very helpful to make sure that the electronic hearing bundle that you prepare is prepared in, in a user-friendly way. And I suspect Professor Qureshi, through his experience, um, both as an advocate and, and as a judge, will probably have much more to say about how evidence is presented um, in, in, in the use of bundles. Um, but, but one thing is clear. Um, some courts have specific rules in relation to the preparation of e-hearing bundles. And if they do have rules, then make sure you follow them. But one of the things I've found challenging is that although in civil cases, it's usually the case that most evidence can be facilitated within the e-hearing bundle. And because it's either a document or a photograph or a drawing, there will be cases where physical exhibits are required. Uh, that's often the case, for example, in criminal in criminal matters. And if it, if you have a case where physical exhibits that need to be examined and inspected, thought is going to have to be given as to how that's going to be facilitated in the context of an online hearing, where people are all appearing from different locations. The key point is that you do need to think about it in advance. Some hearings in London, for example, are not even conducted on video. They're conducted by telephone. And more often than not, during the course of a telephone hearing, somebody will say, oh, I have the document in front of me or I have the photograph in front of me. Well, they can't share it down the telephone. So you need to make sure that if you are having a hearing conducted remotely by telephone, that any documents and other things that you rely on have been shared well in advance of the hearing. Uh, some very specific points to end on. Um, I mention them because I think they're sometimes overlooked. One is in relation to the administration of oaths and affirmations, uh, both in Qatar as in England and many other countries in the world, witnesses are required to give evidence on oath or affirmation. If you are administering an oath remotely, uh, there are some things you need to consider. Uh, first of all, um, how are the words that the witness is required to recite going to be relayed to them. Um, you may provide them in advance. If you're using an application like Zoom, you can put them in the chat box and get the, get the witness to simply read them. Uh, but if the witness wishes to give evidence on a holy book, the witness needs to make sure they have a copy of the relevant book available to them. Uh, these, are all, these all sound like uh, small matters, but they are important and they need to be resolved in advance of the hearing. Interpreters, pose a really unique challenge when it comes to remote hearings. If you have a hearing where an interpreter is required for a witness, for example, there are a number of ways that that can be facilitated. I have so far used two. One is where the interpreter simply appears as an additional participant and interprets consecutively. That is very time consuming and tiring 
both for the interpreter and for everybody else involved, but it is a possible way of doing it. Another way is that some systems, such as the cloud video platform that's used in the UK, do allow third party applications to be used whereby simultaneous interpretation can be provided through a, a designated audio channel and you can have a headset so that you can listen simultaneously to the interpretation. Uh, the one problem with that is that it's very tiring for interpreters to continue to do simultaneous interpretation throughout a, an online hearing, as it is if it was a physical hearing. And so you either need to have multiple interpreters who take turns, or you need to take regular breaks because the interpreter needs them. And on the subject of breaks, it's very helpful to plan for regular breaks uh, at the beginning of the hearing, because online hearings, especially if they last more than a couple of hours, can be very tiring for people. And you can notice it just by looking at the faces of the other participants who are waiting to speak. And if you do notice that, I think it's very helpful to take a break, even if it's only for five minutes. And then finally, I want to just end by saying something on special measures. It's not something that uh, particularly affects commercial cases, but it is something that affects family cases and criminal cases, uh, where, for example, if the case was being conducted physically in the courtroom, a party or a witness might apply for certain special measures to be put in place in order to protect them on account of, for example, their vulnerability. A good example in a criminal or family law context is you might have allegations of domestic violence, for example, where the witnesses simply don't want to see or be seen by the person that they alleged assaulted them. Now, it's very easy to put physical measures in place in a physical courtroom to stop that from happening. But on an online platform, it's very difficult to try and have a system whereby you can see everyone, but other people only have restricted views. And it's a very serious concern uh, for courts generally because witnesses, especially vulnerable witnesses, need to make sure that they are in a position to give their best available evidence. And you certainly don't want them to feel inhibited um, because they feel threatened or intimidated by the presence of other people on the online hearing. That's a very specific point, but it's an important one and one that needs careful consideration in advance of any trial or hearing. And I would like to end on that point because that's my 10 minutes and I shall hand back to Lord Thomas. Um, Christopher, thank you very much for a lot of practical insights into the way in which seeing it both as the, the registrar and as a judge, uh, cases should be conducted. And now we uh, turn to Dr. Minas Kachadurian, who is the legal a council of the Qatar International Center for Conciliation and Arbitration. Uh, <clears throat> he uh, has uh, in distinguished academic credentials, having a PhD in, in arbitration law, but what is probably more important for today, he has extensive experience as an arbitrator, uh, and he is going to talk to us with the benefit of that experience. In addition uh, to uh, the academic experience and the practical experience, he chairs an exit working party at present, and he writes uh, for the uh, both the Cantar Business Law Review, on which is the editorial board, and the MENA Business Law Review. Uh, Dr. Minas, we look forward very much to hearing from you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. I am truly honored to speak today uh, with this distinguished panel chaired by Lord Thomas. And I would like to share with you in the coming few minutes the experience of the Qatar International Arbitration Center for the last 10 months since the beginning of the pandemic and how we have overcome some of the challenges related to the uh, online hearings something which was totally new in our practice since the center was established. Uh, I have prepared a short PowerPoint that I will share with you on the screen. So allow me just to share this together. Okay, so uh, I have titled this presentation by the Kika experience in conducting virtual hearings, 
challenges and solutions. As a matter of introduction, let me tell you that for the last few months, the COVID-19 pandemic had a significant impact on the practice of international commercial arbitration in Qatar and in the entire world. The pandemic had prevented in-person hearings and meetings in most areas of the world. These exceptional circumstances urged arbitration institutions, parties, councils, and arbitrators to adapt to the new reality of submitting arbitration requests online, exchanging submissions and documents electronically, conducting proceedings virtually in light of travel restrictions and compulsory measures of social distancing. All arbitration institutions in the Gulf area, including Qatar, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, without forgetting Oman and Kuwait, have been either partly or fully operational while implementing remote working practices and organizing virtual hearings. This rapid transformation from physical to virtual is largely attributed to the procedural flexibility of international arbitration and to the accessibility and effectiveness of relevant technology. In most of the early cases administered by the Qatar International Center for Conciliation and Arbitration, starting from April 2020 and until December 2020, arbitral tribunals were frequently confronted with situations where the case has progressed regularly to a certain extent according to the established procedural timetable, and there was a hearing date fixed already on the calendar, and it was in this specific scenario that the arbitral tribunal came back often to the center asking what can be the best solution in these circumstances. Should we have the power to manage these arbitrations virtually, or we have to return and ask for the consent of the parties before taking any further step? Therefore, another important and crucial question was to ask ourselves how much we are uh, allowed to conduct virtual hearings for arbitration seated in Qatar and administered by the Kika rules. In doing so, the tribunal will need to carefully consider and assess, in fact, three things. The first thing is the Qatar arbitration law, number two of 2017. Number two, what is said and written in the contract between the parties, which is subject to a dispute actually, and also what the rules of arbitration of the center are providing in this respect. So we try to look into the provisions of the Qatari arbitration law to find out if there is any text which can be of some help in order to give the arbitrators the right to held virtually these uh, arbitration hearings. So we discovered that it's only Article 19 in the Qatari arbitration law which is providing the following. The arbitral tribunal may apply the procedures that it deems appropriate unless there is an agreement between the parties regarding the determination of the arbitration procedures. In other words, 
we found that the Qatari arbitration law is not very helpful. It's not giving any express indication to uh, the possibility to hold virtual hearings. So the Qatari arbitration law, although it was promulgated in 2017, didn't foresee the possibility of conducting arbitrations online. And it is neither prohibiting nor imposing the use of virtual hearing. So we tried also to check if in our Qatari uh, centers of conciliation and arbitration, any similar text can be of some help to the arbitrators. And we discovered that in the chapter dedicated to the arbitration proceedings, Article 18.2 is providing the following. Subject to these rules, the arbitral tribunal may conduct the arbitration in such manner as it considers appropriate, provided that the parties are treated with equality and that at an appropriate stage of the proceedings, each party is given an equal and full opportunity of presenting its case. Here also, as you can uh, see and observe, there is not any express reference to video conferencing or online hearing in the Kika arbitration rules, something that we have to take into consideration when we shall soon update our arbitration rules. Therefore, there has been always a question that would the arbitrators, without the consent of both parties, accept and allow to hold an arbitration virtually? So some of these examples were presented to the arbitration center by the months of May 2020 in two large construction disputes. And there was always this kind of question between whether the tribunal can decide to conduct virtual hearings with or without the consent of the parties. So in fact, the factors which will give us the possibility to answer to this question are of three folds. The first thing is that we have to check in the arbitration law at the seat of arbitration if there is any provision which can give some indication. We shall also check if any contractual provisions, either in the contract or in a subsequent agreement, are giving some possibility and uh, granting some freedom to the arbitrators to conduct the arbitration the way they feel appropriate, according to the circumstances and according to some, I will say, force majeure events like the pandemic. And finally, we have also to check in the procedural rules of the arbitration institution, whether it's the Qatar Arbitration Center, it's the London Court of International Arbitration, the International Chamber of Commerce, or any similar uh, arbitration uh, institution. So the conclusion about how the tribunal should act is that if the applicable arbitration law at the seat of arbitration or the procedural rules applicable by the institution administrating this arbitration refer expressly to the possibility of holding virtual hearing, in this case, the tribunal can go without even taking the consent of the parties. Nevertheless, in the opposite uh, case, if the applicable arbitration law, like the case of Qatar, is silent about these virtual hearings, and in the same way, there is not any indication in the contract between the parties, also in the institution administrating the uh, arbitration, there is not any express indication in this case, we have always advised the arbitrators 
that without the consent of both parties, they should not go virtually, but they have to find a way in order by minimizing the number of the persons attending physically the, uh, the hearings, we could continue and achieve some of these uh, pending cases before the center. And that happened between the months of August and September. We had some pending cases and without holding virtual hearings, we managed by using larger rooms, by using uh, restrict measures of social distancing to hold these arbitrations physically. And the arbitrator was present. We allowed three representatives from each side, three persons to attend. So the whole room was made out of seven people plus only one person who was the secretary of the tribunal. I give you here some statistics on the Kika administrated cases during the pandemic. So between March and December 2020, the uh, center has been dealing with 29 arbitration cases, out of which 23 cases had hearings virtually online, which is an average of 80%. Those who will ask me what happened for the remaining 20%, my answer is very simple. It was either that uh, there wasn't uh, any, uh, I would say, acceptance and consent by both parties to go virtually, or in some cases, in fact, there was only a, an application of arbitration made by one party, and then it happened that the parties came to an agreement or a conciliation or an amicable settlement, so the case was concluded before going into the procedural stage. Well, uh, we know that uh, several arbitration institutions in the world have been uh, publishing guidelines or uh, uh, protocols for the online hearings. Uh, in Kika, we didn't, but we have authorized the tribunals to issue procedural orders. And it was through these orders that each tribunal has set a kind of tailor-made hearing protocol, which was matching with the circumstances of the case and the needs of the parties. The key considerations in such protocols have been of several points. Let me give you just a few points is that Number one concerns the selection of an adequate virtual hearing platform. As the choice of a platform for an online hearing is important, either WebEx, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, or others. Each platform, in fact, have slightly different features and considerations. It is therefore important that parties properly test and explore their options before deciding which is the best for their particular disputes. Also, it's better to have a neutral third party to operate the online platform during the hearings in order to mitigate the risk of parties using technology failures as a basis for allegations of prejudice against each other. Using a third party to arrange a virtual hearing will also allow the parties to focus during the hearing on the substance of the disputes, on their merits, rather than being distracted by technological problems and failures. As with in-person hearings, also real-time transcription services shall be very useful for an online hearing. Parties should agree on an efficient means of document presentation. This is usually achieved by way of an electronic hearing bundle. Depending on the size of the case, 
this might be prepared and operated by a third party provider or sometimes by the parties themselves. Hyperlinking, the next point, is a very useful issue, especially if the parties are able to hyperlink the submission documents and witness evidence to documents they refer to. It is also prudent to agree in advance on a method for uploading any additional documents which might be referred to in the hearing, but which are not in the bundle. Virtual hearings, as we know, bring challenges that will have to be assessed against procedural fairness considerations and against all principles of due process and the right to be heard uh, equally and fairly. I will conclude by some recommendations, and these will be recommendations for the contracts which will be concluded soon, or maybe some contracts which have been concluded and where litigation or arbitration shall be raised soon. So if you are at the stage of drafting a new contract, negotiating the terms of a new contract, it will be recommended to include supplemental wording in order to directly set out the procedural arrangements which will apply in the particular circumstances of a force majeure or a pandemic such as the COVID-19. If you are already at the stage of drafting the terms of reference or drafting the deed of arbitration between the parties and the tribunal, it will be also recommended if you can afford through the terms of the uh, reference to the tribunal more freedom in respect of the format to conduct the hearings. It means allowing them without returning back to the parties to go on virtually. Of course, the procedural orders issued by the tribunal are going to establish the protocols to run virtually these hearings. And in order not to get the risk to have an award being challenged or set aside for any reason, either on an internal level or an international level, I will say that the final award, the arbitrators who draft it should insist and confirm the fact that both parties have recognized getting the full opportunity to present their case and respect of due process throughout the procedures. These recent pandemic cases we had in the Qatar International Arbitration Center have required from the centers to be adapted to this new reality of conducting proceedings virtually in the light of these compulsory measures of social distancing. Nevertheless, such proceedings should maintain continuously the balance between the requirements of a streamlined proceedings and the respect of due process between the parties. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, thank you very much indeed, Dr. That was an excellent presentation. And it was very good to hear that you've managed to keep the arbitrations going and have a very flexible system. Uh, your experience uh, coincides with a lot in my And now we turn uh, to uh, hear from Professor Kawa Kureki. Uh, as you know, he's a very distinguished uh, international counsel. Um, there, if someone could mute. Dr. Minas, could you mute your... Yes, sorry. I think that's better. There was a lot of feedback. Uh, I was about, and I didn't want to spoil my introduction to Pro, uh, Professor Kawa Kureishi. Um, it is ready to say he's a very distinguished uh, uh, counsel practicing in many different uh, jurisdictions and acting for very many different kinds of cases, particularly both before, <clears throat> for and against uh, governments. He has the distinction of having uh, established McNair Chambers in Qatar, to which we're, for which we're all very grateful. 
and his extensive experience includes not only being a professor uh, of commercial law at London University uh, since 2006, but also a Deputy High Court judge uh, in London uh, since uh, 2013. Uh, I look forward very much to hearing his uh, do's and don'ts in this very valuable seminar. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to begin by thanking Lord Thomas for the very kind introduction, uh, as well as the International Court and the QICCA for participating in this event. I share uh, Lord Thomas's view that whatever may happen for the next six or seven months, the new normal contains with it the inevitability that there will be far more recourse to online hearings. In the course of the next 10 or 15 minutes, I want to share with you some uh, of my experiences in terms of having conducted online hearings as an advocate, having participated in them from the other side in the, an adjudicative capacity. And of course, so far as technology is concerned, we ought to remember that even before COVID-19, there were many institutions that were having recourse to technology, even if it was something as simple as a telephone line, which of course we all take for granted. And we also, thanks to COVID-19, take for granted the ability to be able to look at each other uh, through a video link that even 10 years ago, that wouldn't have been as clear as it is now. Uh, so institutions, many of them provided for flexibility in that their rules were silent. And it's in the face of silence that arbitrators and arbitral tribunals were actually encouraged through guidance from some of the institutions to adopt effective case management procedures. We saw in uh, April and indeed thereafter, certain litigants demonstrating, displaying hesitation about recourse to online hearings. Of course, there's the old saying that in every litigation, there's a party that wants it to be concluded swiftly. And there's another that would rather drag it out for as long as possible. And of course, it's no coincidence that one feels confident that it will win and the other feels confident or perhaps pessimistic somewhat that it will lose. But in England, our courts have been very, very slow to entertain any suggestion that the COVID-19 pandemic somehow uh, pro provides a, a reason for the courts not only to stop proceedings, but to deploy hybrid uh, procedure, whereby some of the hearing takes place in person, some takes place remotely. And the first real illustration of that was in a case called One Black Fires as early as 6th of April, 2020. In the arbitral context, I know myself on several occasions in international arbitrations, foreign parties saying to me, we can't possibly have this three, four hundred million dollar arbitration conducted remotely. This is so unfair. Of course, it had nothing to do with the fact that there were maybe half a dozen government officials who had been looking forward to come to England. And it happened to be the, the summer period and they were hoping that it would be postponed until the following year. Perish the thought it had nothing to do with that. There was a genuine concern, no doubt because of unfamiliarity with, with technology, that somehow something would be lost in the electronic translation, for want of a better word. And I shared that misgiving to some extent. The misgiving relates largely to the way in which one communicates through the medium of a camera to a screen that may be no more than 26 inches containing half a dozen faces and perhaps also uh, right now, there's some text which you're trying to look at and you're trying to understand what's going on in the minds of your opponents, the witnesses and others. And so there's a physical impossibility in terms of being able to receive that which we as human beings through the process of evolution rely on the most, namely the non-verbal communication. Be that as it may, the reality is that the, the arbitral institutions and the courts have been slow to countenance any halt of proceedings on the basis of lack of fairness. The most recent example, a very recent example, is an excellent uh, decision of Mr. Justice Marcus Smith in the Chancery Division of the 10th of January of this year in a case called Bilter versus SVS. The court had set down a five-week trial commencing on the 25th of January of this year and the issues included questions of honesty on the part of several of the defendant's witnesses. These witnesses sought uh, an adjournment of the trial on the basis they put forward, that they had concerns about coming into London 
because of this new alleged mutant strain that emanates in England and just to assuage everyone's concerns, it wasn't made in England. This mutation may well have come from somewhere else. So perhaps a little bit, it's a little bit unfair to say it was made in the UK. But in any event, that was one of the arguments they deployed. And they also were concerned about being in a hearing room with counsel and the judge, who is a, a very nice judge, uh, their own counsel and opponents. The approach that the judge adopted is very interesting. He made the following comment, the gold standard for witness evidence on issues of honesty is in person. That's very important. We mustn't lose sight of that. However, in the circumstances where the court uh, had made available what's called a, a super court, where there's a, a huge courtroom, anybody who's been to England, to the Rolls building, the new building that Lord Thomas, when he was the Lord Chief Justice, was uh, presiding over the opening of, I remember it all too well. We have fantastic facilities and the rooms are huge. So the super court had been allocated for this uh, case. That's there would be a minimum number of people in the courtroom physically, and that the witnesses were being allocated precious parking spaces in the judicial car park, no less, to drive in so as to give their witness evidence. Now, if some of you may remember there was a hearing involving alleged celebrities, uh, all about what they were or were not doing to each other during the summer, and they were beneficiaries, I understand, of, if not a parking spot in the rural courts of justice, but at least the drop off and, and pick up facility that the rest of us are not uh, provided with. So Ilta versus SVS, very recent example of the court's approach, a very robust approach. Now, practical issues. I agree entirely with uh, Dr. Minas, where possible, and you're using uh, online platforms, have recourse to third party providers, because then there can be no doubt of any jiggery pokery on the part of the opponent. There was a case that I was doing during the summer and two, in, two interruptions took place during the course of our presentation. One, when my South African co-counsel was seeking to address the August tribunal, including two of retired Supreme Court judges from our Supreme Court on a, an, a, an abstract point of, of law from South Africa, that was interrupted. And then when I was cross-examining a witness who was sitting in the comfort of his own home in Connecticut, in his kitchen, no less, the internet was disrupted. And we were told, and this, is, this was serious, that there'd been a, a bomb hoax nearby and the police had cut the, the internet. What we had done by way of a backup is have a telephone connection so that we were able to communicate nevertheless. So third party, always try and use a third party service provider to ensure neutrality and also of course, to ensure familiarity. But we're already using uh, electronic mechanisms for hearings, whether in court or in arbitration. The document viewing software, if you're about to start a proceeding, if your institution doesn't identify the software, you ought to try and agree it with your counterparties right at the outset. Real time transcripts are a boon, especially for counsel when you're trying to cross examine a witness. And then in the, in the, in the bad old days, some way may remember, it was all about what your junior had written in their blue note and their solicitor. And of course, there was a fight about what was or wasn't said. But in our courts in England, there is something known as the mechanical uh, recording room where everything that happens in the courts, as I discovered during my uh, practice, is recorded, everything. When I say everything, I mean everything from very early on. And so if you happen to uh, be in those courts in the not too distant future, just bear that in mind. Uh, just as it was said that by, by Chris, that when you're online, uh, don't forget that people can hear you. It's the same in, in, in our courts, but ensure there's uniformity. Uh, when it comes to video and audio recording of hearings, this is also extremely important and it enables you to go back and look at what's happened. Of course, that's if you use these facilities properly. If they're used badly and that there's a disconnect, people are trying to deploy different systems or the technology is one that you're not familiar with, you will lose time and you will also create a high degree of irritation on the part of the adjudicative body, whether it's an arbitral tribunal or a court. And that's not something that you ever want to do. You never want to upset the judge or the arbitrators. There's some hints that you may find are the Royal Courts of Justice, the ICC, Singapore International Arbitration Center, amongst others, have provided very helpful guidance on conducting hearings remotely. Read that guidance if you're about to start for the first time. Ask yourself, how many people need to participate? Visible, firstly. Audible, secondly. The, uh, Chris is absolutely right that at the beginning of the hearing, 
people ought to introduce themselves so that there's an opportunity to, to test what the facilities are providing in terms of audibility and clarity of, of picture quality, but try and limit the number of people if you can. You've got to make sure you've got a strong internet connection because that can drop. Uh, I, I gave you a concrete example of something that happened during the summer. Have a backup, perhaps a, a telephone link, which you can invoke very quickly. Ensure that everybody who has a participating role, everybody, is familiar with the platform, that it's loaded onto their computer, that their camera is up to the uh, specification that's required, that the microphone works, and that there are test runs, practice sessions even, so that they understand the dynamic of communicating to a, a camera and the people who are behind it. When it comes to witness examination, that's where many advocates, I suspect, have some degree of, of concern with regards to online hearings, the ability of a tribunal or adjudicative body, a court, to impress upon a witness the onerous nature of the obligation when they assume a, uh, the role of a witness, that they are under oath, it's very difficult to uh, suggest that there is anything remotely resembling that when a witness is sitting at home in the comfort of their kitchen, dining room, study, sitting on the sofa. And of course, witness testament, testimony, witness credibility plays a vital role in many court and arbitral hearings. I gave you the example of the approach of the judge in the uh, Bilter case, where questions of uh, honesty were at large, the witness evidence would be heard in person in the courts. When you're communicating amongst yourselves as a team, how are you going to do it? It's bad enough for a counsel uh, such as myself where I'm looking at a screen, no matter how big it is, someone's sharing a document, but then I'm also being passed messages. The technique that we used in one case, which was very successful, is to have part of the team behind me. There were half a dozen other people that are involved as well, government officials, other lawyers, and my instructing solicitor sitting in front of me. And the instructing solicitor was on a WhatsApp group. Questions as to security, I'm sure arise in the, in the minds of many of you, but he very helpfully filtered through the messages and made sure that he was off screen, off camera. So if there were any messages coming through, they were put on, on my desk in good old fashioned paper form. And I was able to then, if necessary, deploy whatever message was being given to me, uh, either before the tribunal or in the context of my examination of the witness. Do's and don'ts. Uh, this is a, uh, in terms of do's, do please keep your microphone muted unless you're speaking. And of course, don't forget to turn it on when you are speaking, which we sometimes all forget. Do what Dr. Minas did when he was referring us to the catalog, highlight relevant text. That's extremely important. There is no doubt in my mind that online hearings are much more physically demanding. And the research that I've read indicates that it's because we are programmed, as it were, to be able to receive nonverbal messaging. And that fills a, a large proportion of our understanding of a situation. And when that nonverbal messaging is not available to us, the brain is nevertheless still uh, seeking it out. And that's why partly there's physical exhaustion. And of course, your eyes are, are maintaining a focus in front for hours on end. But having said that, try and maintain eye contact with the court or tribunal wherever possible. I suspect there's nothing more disconcerting for an arbitral tribunal, let alone uh, for counsel or a, a court where you have a judge who is perhaps looking elsewhere, perhaps looking at their telephone or as in one case, speaking on the telephone, albeit on mute, while somebody's making submissions. Speak more slowly. If you want your message to be understood by a court or tribunal, it's a, a it's advice that was given to me from the very beginning of my career. I've tried to adhere to it as often as possible, perhaps not as often as I ought to, but whatever might be clear in one's own mind as an advocate, it's imparting that information in a, in a, in a, in a sufficiently persuasive manner with clarity that achieves the ultimate objective. Speak more slowly. If you do so, people will pay more attention.
structure your submissions very clearly. You must maintain not only your own focus and attention, but that of your tribunal. They need to be able to follow the train of your argument. I was involved in an arbitral hearing where counsel, I won't say who, very eminent leading counsel, Queen's counsel, uh, didn't provide any structure for his submissions. I'm not saying, <laughs> I, I tend to adopt an approach along the lines of this is the, 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 the process I'm going to adopt, the route that I'm going to adopt for my submissions. It, I, I believe it, it's, it, it helps me understand what I'm seeking to present, provides clarity for me, and hopefully helps the tribunal understand where I'm going eventually. So structure your submissions to maintain that focus and attention for yourself as well as others. In terms of don'ts, don't have distracting backgrounds or noises. Your mobile phone may go off. You may have clicking noises in the background when your emails are being received. And don't fidget when you're visible because just as in, in a courtroom or an arbitral hearing room, arbitrators are often found glancing across to see what somebody's reaction is. Don't be surprised if they're looking at you in the midst of the material that they're being hopefully not bombarded with, but, but, but that's being shared with them. And so sit still and don't fidget. Admittedly, even more difficult when you're looking, peering at a tiny uh, computer uh, video camera, which may be just a few centimeters, uh, centimeters across, but it's important to remember that. And don't read almost verbatim what you've already set out in your pleadings or written submissions. The arbitrators, most diligent arbitrators, and certainly judges in, in, in our courts in England, will have read your submissions. We use skeleton arguments, and they are restricted in terms of page length. So don't read what you've already provided the court or tribunal with. Summarize it. Understand where your opponent's coming from, deal with the weaknesses, and allow the court or tribunal an opportunity to question you. And definitely do not speak over the tribunal, your opponent, or a witness. Difficult to do because there may be a time lag in the signal. But you can see when someone's speaking, the screen is green. And if there's something you want to be able to say to the court or tribunal, you have the chat box. The, the penultimate point I wanted to share with you is that when there are breakout sessions, and as Chris has very rightly pointed out, there ought to be some breakout sessions timetabled in most arbitral uh, hearings. It's halfway through the morning session, halfway through the afternoon session, not least for the transcript writers to be able to take a breath and swap, but also for the rest of us, counsel, if you're counsel in an arbitral hearing, uh, Unlike in most courts, you are treated to generally nice coffee and nice biscuits in the corridor foyer outside. But when you're in your virtual breakout room, be careful. If there's a third party provider, hopefully you're on mute. If you have the slightest doubt, then engage in communication with your team outside the room using a different method, such as a, a WhatsApp group, if that's secure. Last but not least, least, do not use, overuse PowerPoint, overload the slides, or provide a tribunal or court with copious text on screen, because that's a waste of time. To expect a court or tribunal to be able to listen to you and read what's on screen, let alone if it's not been highlighted, is a folly, and it won't do your clients any good. Conclusion, there's been terrible suffering of that, there is no doubt, caused by COVID-19, but in this context, it's forced the pace of change. There are many who would rather not have engaged with online hearings, but they're forced to. And happily, I can tell you that by and large, they work. And by and large, I've got no doubt that they're here to stay in either full or hybrid form. And I've got no doubt equally that for short hearings, for a couple of hours, or witness examination, which is less controversial than perhaps some, online is going to be the default. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor uh, Kamal Qureshi, uh, Queen's Council, for such an excellent and practical presentation.
we've I see been running now for just an hour. I'm not quite sure whether we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, but uh, 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 is uh, 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 I think if anyone wants to ask one, can they put it in the chat function, in the question and answer function? I think there's one already that has just come in, uh, and it's by uh, Karen and Kini, uh, uh, who asks, do you envisage any enforcement problems for awards after online hearings where that state doesn't allow online hearings in their court systems? Um, I think if I could ask, uh, first of all, Professor Qureshi for his view, uh, and then Dr. Minas uh, Kachadurian for his answer, but keep them short, because I do think we have to try and not run on too long on these seminars. Thank you, Lord Thomas. In terms of the question, the, the starting point is the New York Convention 1958, Article 5, question of public policy and fairness. Um, we've already seen many international arbitral tribunals under the ICSID arena and otherwise ICC, LCI, uh, adopt the standpoint that hybrid hearings or even full virtual hearings are consistent with the requirement of fairness and domestic courts. So it would be, uh, it's possible plainly in certain jurisdictions, I can think of some where the courts are perhaps less enthusiastic about enforcement of arbitral rewards than others for such an argument to be deployed, but it ought to be given short shrift if the arbitral tribunal has considered matters carefully and adopted a process that is ultimately fair. Dr. Minas. You need to unmute. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, my reply will be that uh, in our case here in Qatar, the uh, courts have not been tested yet by such cases, but we believe that uh, uh, it depends on how much the jurisdiction in question is coping with uh, requirements uh, in modernizing its legislations by using electronic means of communication. If they have a modern, for example, a law on electronic signatures, if they have a law on electronic commerce, so uh, as much as there will be, uh, I would say, features of using electronic means, there will be also uh, a, uh, a good acceptance by the courts of having uh, online uh, awards rendered by the tribunals. Furthermore, I will say also that uh, as long as in the wording itself of the uh, awards, uh, there have been uh, several confirmations throughout the award that both parties had not any objection on conducting this arbitration online and that there was a full respect of the due process principle and the, that the parties were at equal arms. So this is going to help the judge not to accept but to reject any application to set aside the award. Well, thank you very much. I don't see any other questions. I'll wait half a minute for any others to appear, uh, which gives me the opportunity to thank all of the speakers on your behalf for such an excellent series of presentations. I very much uh, hope that anything that is done electronically, whether it be in a court in an overseas country or uh, in an arbitration will be recognized. It would be a terrible step backwards if it's not provided, of course, the arbitration has been conducted fairly. But now there is so much experience of conducting hearings and arbitrations on the online process. I am optimistic for the future. No further question has appeared. It therefore remains for me just to say thank you uh, to McNair Chambers, and in particular its chief executive for having organized this so efficiently. Uh, to the uh, Qatar International Center for Conciliation and Arbitration uh, and uh, to the uh, Qatar International Court and Dispute Resolution Center for putting on this seminar, which I think has been of great practical value. And particular thanks for the very distinguished speakers for their very concise and yet a very telling number of points. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.